Thank you. Good evening to all of you and welcome to this conference. I have no doubt you're all here uh, to hear about everything space and space exploration have, has taught us about international cooperation. Um, but before that, I would like to introduce our two guest speakers. Tonight, we are, we are honored to host Mr. Mike Griffin, or shall I say Dr. Mike Griffin. He is indeed an accomplished scholar who holds no less than seven degrees, ranging from computer science to aerospace engineering. He served as administrator of NASA from 2001 to, 2000, to 2009, which means that he was the chief decision maker during these years, which for in instance include key decisions about SpaceX and the International Space Station. He was under secretary for defense, uh, for research and engineering from, from 2018 to 2020. And last but not least, he is a member of the American Astronautical Society and of the International Academy for Astronautics and a lecturer at various universities. Thank you, Mr. Griffin, for being here with us tonight. We also have the pleasure of hosting Mr. Jean-Jacques Dordain. Uh, Mr. Dordain graduated from École Centrale in 1969 and has held several positions in the French Office for Aerospace Studies and Research, l'ONERA. He has taught courses in French engineering schools as well as universities abroad. Um, he was one of the five French astronaut candidates to be selected for the European Space Lab program. And in 1998, he was named executive secretary at the Japanese Space Agency and later started as director of launches at the European Space Agency, where he became director general in 2003. Twice reappointed, he stayed Director General from 2003 to 2015, presiding over a number of successes, amongst which the launch of the Rosetta Comet Chaser mission and the first Soyuz rocket launch from French Guiana in Kourou. Mr. Dordain, thank you for coming here tonight. Finally, I want to take the time to thank the Chair Science et Défis du Spatial, without whom this conference could not have taken place and who strives to offer excellent courses and opportunities to students uh, interested in special matters. I also want to thank the X-Space uh, Alumni Association who helped us organize the conference and are in the audience, I am sure. Um, one last practical note before this begins. You can send a question whenever you want during the conference for it to be answered at the end. You may do this by signing in on the Tribune de Lix website and uh, navigating to the Débat tab. You can also vote for existing questions you'd like to see answered. And now, without further ado, I leave the floor to our two guests. Uh, thank you for your patience, and please enjoy the conference. Thank you for the honor of appearing at the Ecole Polytechnique and I apologize that the last time I said any French words was 60 years ago, uh, and I have not studied it enough since then. So I am honored to be here, thank you. Um, when, uh, when I was approached about speaking to the student body here at the Ecole, um, I was reluctant to do so without my longtime friend and colleague, um, uh, Jean-Jacques, who, of course, has been a professor here. Um, but all of the things that, that I have been able to do in the US space program that are of a cooperative nature have been, have been aided and facilitated by Monsieur Dodin. I, we, would, we have accomplished much together, um, I think, in those years, uh, far more than either of us could have done by ourselves. Um, when we were speaking earlier, um, Jean-Jacques suggested that we make a point of uh, not so much talking broadly about space and inter international cooperation, and we will, we will do that, but um, to cite some specific examples. And so I will give you a couple from my career, some of which are re uh, related to those of, of Jean-Jacques. 
So my first experience with international cooperation was as a much younger engineer when I worked on the Hubble Space Telescope. And as all of you here know, the Hubble Space Telescope carried then and still carries today um, several instruments, four or five instruments, um, several of which uh, have international principal investigators uh, in, in charge of their instruments because the science that was done on Hubble and the instruments that were put on Hubble um, went well beyond that of, of any individual nation, certainly beyond that of the United States. And, uh, and I think that was a good thing. That was, that was my, again, my first introduction to those possibilities. Um, a little bit later on, uh, I became involved with NASA. I spent a period of time as the chief engineer of NASA. Uh, it was in that role where I first met Jean-Jacques. And by that time, the space station that we were planning was already an international space station. And we had, um, in that time, uh, we had the very great difficulty of asking ourselves how we wanted to deal with Russia after, um, after the breakup of the Soviet Union and as the Cold War came to an end. Now, this is before most of you here in this audience were born, but, um, and, and things have not with Russia turned out as well as we hoped. I would certainly say that. But in 1991 and 92 and 93, we, we held out great hope. And one of the things that we wanted to do was to provide um, incentives, to provide a promise for Russia to join the international community. And there was maybe no better way to do that at the time than with a high profile endeavor like space exploration. So, the United States was then the leader of a 13 or so country coalition to put together the space station with laboratories and facilities and all of that furnished by, by all the nations. And we, figured, we had to figure out how to include Russia. And that resulted in a very significant change because to include Russia in the partnership meant that we had to pick an entirely different orbit around the Earth. And I know that many of you here are not space people, so I will say that the initial orbit around the Earth was to be inclined at an angle about like this, but to reach Russia, we had to change it to an angle about like that. It was quite a significant thing to do, very difficult technically to do, because it meant that the space shuttle, which was our primary means of assembling the space station could only carry maybe half or a little bit more than half the planned payload. And so all of the other nations had to adjust, um, adjust their laboratory modules. They had to adjust much of their equipment um, in order to include Russia. Um, and that was done. And no one was more helpful than than Jean-Jacques, and no agency was more helpful than the European Space Agency in bringing this about. And it was a very difficult time. Now, at that time, we all thought that it was worth it because we thought that including Russia in the community of nations in such a high-profile endeavor um, would be beneficial. And it may yet prove to be. Maybe today's events are, are maybe they are transitory. We, we can hope so. Um, I left NASA in 1994, returned to NASA in 2005, this time not as the chief engineer, but as the uh, administrator of NASA. The, in a way, I was still the chief engineer. I was just at a higher level of chief engineer. I have never been able to leave being an engineer behind. So in 2005 and six, we were hopeful then that the, first of all, that we could recover from the loss of the space shuttle and continue assembling the space station, which we did. 
but again, only with the cooperation of all the nations involved in it because everything was going to be delayed. The United States was, over, was more than two years recovering from the loss of the space shuttle, and at that time we did in fact have to depend upon our Russian partners to put um, equipment and supplies in orbit uh, in order to sustain the station, which was approximately one-third built. We needed our Russian partners to help sustain the station development um, until, we could, until we could pick up uh, the load again. And they did that. And, but all of our international partners had to spend additional money to carry, to carry their engineering teams, to store their hardware, uh, to adjust their futures in, in order to deal with the delay caused by the loss of the space shuttle. But they all did that, and when we resumed, we were able to finish the space station, and it flies overhead every day, 14 times a day, every day, and it is still being used by the international community of astronauts. Today there are seven people, there are seven people uh, in orbit around the Earth, not counting the Chinese who have, I think, three at this moment. Um, moving beyond the space station, my experience of international cooperation goes to the James Webb Space Telescope, which I think all of you know uh, was just launched last Christmas, this past Christmas. It was launched on an Ariane 5. Um, again, the, the instruments on the James Webb Space Telescope come from everywhere, and the, and the scientific investigators come from everywhere. The body of the Space Telescope was built in the United States uh, by, by Northrop Grumman, um, but the launch was on an Ariane 5. Um, despite the fact that many in my country wanted the launch to be on a U.S. rocket, um, I wanted to find a way to include our international partners uh, in the James Webb Space Telescope program, and uh, Jean-Yves Legal, a name known to all of you, I'm sure, as the former president of CNES and the former um, chairman of Ariane Space, and Jean-Jacques and I collaborated together and closed a deal in 2005 or 6 that the launch of James Webb would be on Ariane 5. Now, we all thought it would be by 2009 or 10. <laughs> We were very badly wrong. It took a lot more effort to put the James Webb Space Telescope together than any of us had hoped. But when we finally got it together, um, it did in fact launch on an Ariane 5. That agreement was kept for a period of over 15 years. I'm very proud of that. Um, finally, our experience with, uh, uh, my, my recent experience with collaboration in space uh, extends to the uh, Orion Command and Service Module, which we hope will, in the not terribly distant future, carry people back to the moon for the first time in almost 60 years. Um, and the service module on the Orion spacecraft is uh, a European contribution. So it didn't start out that way, but we changed it to that. So. Uh, those are some of the experiences I've had. You'll note that I can't cite any bad experiences in there. Those were all good experiences. They all took um, longer than I would have hoped, longer than any of us would have hoped, and they probably cost more money than we all would have hoped. Um, but in many ways, they were very much the right thing to do. I've talked longer than I wanted to. I will let my friend and partner now speak his words, and then we will be available for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So I shall repeat what Mike has said, but with my accent. So it's, uh, uh, but, uh, but first of all, I must say that I am uh, Moved to be uh, back in this uh, room because uh, I have spent uh, 14 years as uh, an assistant professor in this uh, uh, Ecole Polytechnique, and uh, 
it's still uh, it's still uh, very close uh, to my heart, and especially because I have a lot of uh, anciens élèves uh, with whom I am still working. Uh, but coming to uh, to cooperation, first of all. When I was director general of Visa, and you, you see the, the difference between uh, we as administrator and director general, we we had we were wearing ties, and uh, now uh, we are the same but without tie. Uh, uh, speaking of international cooperation, I I was always saying to my colleagues, uh, NASA administrator. Director General of uh, the Russian Space Agency, the uh, Director General of the Chinese Space Agency, and so on. I, I was always telling them, if there is one topic on which I can teach you, it's international cooperation. Because when you are the Director General of ISA, international cooperation is your daily work. We, we don't know what means not cooperating, because it's 22 countries working together. And... Uh, I can tell you that it's difficult, but very successful. So uh, this is the way I, I define international cooperation. But uh, I would like to, to take the uh, concrete example that uh, Mike uh, went through uh, to give the uh, uh, other side of the coin of uh, this cooperation, uh, because we have made together a lot of cooperation and concrete cooperation. So this is not theory, this is not uh, a PowerPoint, this is uh, very concrete. Uh, and I would like to, to start by the Hubble Space Telescope. Yes, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, uh, has a significant European contribution uh, to the point that uh, almost one third of the, uh, of the data are uh, uh, for European scientists, and uh, part of this contribution is also the uh, servicing of the Hubble Space Telescope. And, uh, and there, there were several ESA astronauts contributing to the servicing of the Hubble Space Telescope because that has been uh, important for the life of the telescope. The telescope would not have provided so many data, so many discoveries without the servicing. And that I would like to make two remarks. Number one, one of the servicing uh, was uh, uh, with Jean-François Clairvoy, who, is, uh, uh, who has been my elève uh, at Ecole Polytechnique, but... Uh, who, uh, who is coming from this school. Uh, but also, I would like to, uh, to give credit to Mike Griffin, because he was the one to, uh, to decide the last, the last servicing of the Hubble Space Telescope has been decided by Mike. And I can tell you that at that time, it was not so easy, because it was in the wake of the uh, shuttle accident and, uh, and the assembly of the space station, which was the priority of the priority. But Mike Griffin, administrator of NASA, has decided to uh, make the last mission of servicing of the Hubble Space Telescope, in spite of all the critics, because after the Columbia accident, uh, it, w it has been very difficult to convince the politicians that uh, the shuttle could go in space without going to the space station, which was a heaven that, uh, which was used for, for, for the crew. So uh, that is uh, to the credit of Mike. Then he was speaking of the space station. That's true that uh, we, we were uh, very lucky, I must say, that uh, to be uh, there when uh, uh, there was the reunification in orbit between the space station Freedom, which was the space station of the West, with United States, Canada, uh, Japan, and ESA, and the uh, Mir-2 station, which was the Russian space station, and we have reunified these two space stations into one, which is the current International Space Station. 
maybe I would like to make one remark there. It's, uh, and uh, Mike mentioned that it's, uh, we had to select one orbit. We, to reunify two stations, we had to select only one orbit. We could not leave two stations on different orbits. And uh, we had, we, the Western countries, we had to accept to go to the 51 degree orbit, which is the latitude of Baikonur, uh, because Soyuz could not go to the 28 degree orbit where the space station Freedom was uh, supposed to, to go. And by doing that, the space shuttle, which was flying from 28 degree to 51 degree, has lost half of its performance. And that was a lot of consequence on the, uh, on the partners of Space Station Freedom, because our laboratory, the European laboratory, which was called Columbus, uh, we had to reduce the size of uh, our laboratory by a factor of two. And that was not uh, easy. And this is just to tell you that that was one of my key experience at ESA, because uh, I was still naive at that time, and I thought that a small laboratory would cost less than a big laboratory, and I was totally wrong. Uh, just demonstrating that the cost of a product uh, may not be directly associated to the product. Uh, so, uh, because the small laboratory costed more, and much more than the big laboratory. Uh, there is obviously an, uh, uh, an objective reason for that, which is the calendar. Uh, because uh, moving from uh, space station freedom to the International Space Station has introduced a lot of uh, change of calendar, but also the Columbia, the, the, the space shuttle accident and Columbus was launched by, has been launched by uh, the space shuttle. The, the, the shuttle accident has introduced another uh, increase of calendar to the point that we have called that laboratory Columbus because it was due to be launched in 1992 which was the 500th anniversary of uh, Christopher Columbus in America. So uh, 1992 was the original date. And uh, the, uh, at the end, uh, the launch of Columbus took place in 2008, meaning uh, 16 years of delays. But we made it. We made it, and uh, there I would like also to give credit to, uh, to Mike, because the, uh, the shuttle back in flight has a lot to do with uh, Monsieur Mike Griffin, who, uh, and he said that himself, uh, uh, was a very good administrator, but he was even a much better engineer. He is the best engineer that I know. And, uh, and he, he was the one to put back the, the, the shuttle uh, in flight, which was not easy because after the second accident, I can tell you that uh, it was not uh, easy. But he did it. And we have launched Columbus. And uh, in 2008, in February 2008, and just one month later, we have launched our first Ariane trans transfer vehicle, or automatic. I, I, I don't remember if the A is Ariane transfer vehicle or automatic transfer vehicle, but it's ATV. It's okay, so just to say it. Anyway, it was launched by Ariane. But uh, the ATV was an interesting uh, vehicle also. It was a 20-ton vehicles, vehicle. Uh, making an automatic rendezvous and docking with the 400 tons space station in orbit. So you have to realize that it's 20 tons, totally automatic, uh, for the rendezvous and docking, and 
400 tons stationed with the crew on board. So I can tell you that uh, to have NASA accepting such a huge vehicle, because no, the, the other vehicles were not as big as the ATV. To have the NASA people accepting that uh, these uh, Europeans could dock automatically to a, a station with uh, six people on board, it was not easy. And again, the solution was Mike Griffin, because I asked him to chair the final review, the final technical review of the ATV. And he was the one to convince NASA that we could do it. And we have done that. And we have done that five times with no problem whatsoever. And this is because we have done that that uh, NASA, and that was uh, uh, again a breakthrough in the history of cooperation, NASA has accepted to have the service module of the Orion capsule, the vehicle which will go to the moon with uh, a crew. The service module is made in Europe as a consequence of our success of the ATV. And uh, that is uh, a breakthrough in the history of cooperation between NASA and ESA, because to have NASA accepting, again, Europe in the critical, on the critical path of uh, the uh, uh, crew transportation, I can tell you that it, that also was a, a fantastic breakthrough. So, uh, the last program that he mentioned that was James Webb, and this is true that uh, we have agreed between uh, Jean-Yves Le Gall, who, who was at Ariane Espace at that time, uh, Mike Griffin, who was NASA, and myself, Isa. We have agreed to launch uh, James Webb uh, by Ariane 5, and it was in 2005, and uh, the launch took place uh, 16 years later, just to say that cooperation is something which is very resilient. Uh, but uh, it was not so easy also to, to make a deal. Monsieur Griffin had a lot of problems with the uh, US part because putting the jewel of, of NASA, James Webb, on board a European launcher was not so easy for uh, the US part to accept. And on my side, I can tell you that I had also some difficulties to explain why I was using the money of the scientific program of ESA to, pay, to, to, to finance a launch vehicle. But OK, we made it. And the launch took place in December last year. To the point that when Monsieur Griffin left NASA, uh, I said, and I think that he still remembers that uh, it was very difficult to cooperate with NASA, because it's difficult to cooperate. But it was so easy to cooperate with Mike Griffin. And this is, the message is to say that the people have a very important role in any cooperation. Cooperation, yes, it's between ESA and NASA. But at the end, it's uh, discussion and negotiations between persons. And that is uh, very important. And I dare to say that uh, if Monsieur Griffin had stayed more administrator of NASA, we would have made ExoMars together with NASA, that I am convinced of that. Unfortunately, uh, the, administration, the administration changed in the United States, and. Uh, we could not finalize the discussion uh, between Mike and myself. But OK, so this is just to say that our relationship and our friendship is built up on projects. And uh, nothing can replace that. Cooperation is not just, uh, uh, obviously, you have to uh, uh, 
I, I was going to say to like your partner, no. Uh, that I say that many times. Uh, uh, mutual interest is much more sustainable than love. So you, you, you have not to love your partner. But you, you have to have mutual interest. And uh, by the way, this is how the 22 countries of ISA are working together. Obviously, they are friends. But I can tell you that I, I have attended a lot of meetings where uh, they really did not like each other. But at the end, they were making projects together because they could identify mutual interest. But uh, uh, cooperation is, is difficult, always difficult. And, uh, but is, uh, is certainly sustainable. Uh, if we could sustain the space station after the shuttle accident, it was because we were cooperating with the Russians. Without the Russians, we would have uh, had to, to stop the space station. So at that time, the Russians were the ones to give us the, the possibility to, to sustain the space station. And by the way, you know that in spite of the conflicts on, uh, on planet Earth, uh, yesterday there was uh, again a launch of a crew, uh, American and uh, Russian, going, going together to the space station, showing that uh, in spite of okay, the heavy problems that we have on planet Earth, the, the, the cooperation still continues, obviously, at a much reduced uh, level, but uh, uh, can continue. Last point, and after I, uh, it's, it will be your turn. Uh, the, the question is, is exploration the, 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 the privileged domain of, uh, of international cooperation? Certainly, yes, if this is exploration for knowledge and science. Because knowledge and science is a mutual interest uh, between uh, different countries. And this is certainly uh, the best reason to, uh, to cooperate. So when exploration is focused on knowledge and, uh, and science, I am convinced that international cooperation will continue. Now, the day exploration becomes a commercial market. Uh, for example, starting by the tourism, there, there is competition. Uh, and as you know, uh, the, there is more and more, uh, more, and more uh, projects uh, to, uh, to bring tourists in, in space. And by the way, last year, 2021, there, have, there, there, there were more tourists than professional astronauts in space. So tourism, yes, is only at start, but becomes a market. To the point that there is more and more projects for private stations. The International Space Station is what it is. It will continue for some time. But uh, there is more and more projects of... Uh, of private uh, stations, and that is also a domain of competition. For the time being, mostly between US enterprise, huh? Musk, Bezos, uh, uh, Axiom, uh, Orbital Reef, etc., etc. But there, there is competition there. Uh, and uh, this will be my last sentence. Cooperation cannot be dissociated from competition. This is life, normal life. Normal life is made of cooperation and competition. And, uh, uh, but cooperation is always based on mutual interest. But competition is necessary to have the best ideas. The best ideas are not coming from cooperation. The best ideas are coming from competition. And this is the reason why we have to try and combine the interests of cooperation on one side, say, uh, projects of mutual interest, but also of competition. 
because competition is the best, the only way, I would say, the only way to have the best ideas, and we need to have the best solutions. So, thank you very much, and now uh, we shall uh, listen to you. Thank you. So thank you for this very insightful presentation, for those two very insightful presentations. So now we are going to answer your question. We have a lot of questions about that. And I think we won't have time to deal with all of them, but we are going to start now. So um, the first one is a very simple question. Is it possible and relevant to imagine a world space agency? Certain, certainly, it is. It is possible. It is. It's possible to imagine a, a world government um, that will not come in the time of any of us here. I suspect, but when one looks to the future, um, in in the end, wars between nations will only stop if if there is a global governing body that has sufficient power to put a stop to it. Um, bad behavior between individuals only stops when there is a police force and, and so on up the scale. Um, so in the context of the future, um, yes, I think there could be a world space agency. Uh, I think it will be a while, but I can imagine it. Yes, I, okay. I, again, having, having been in charge of uh, an agency with 22 countries, I have difficulties to imagine uh, an agency with 190 countries. Uh, that uh, poor guy. Uh, <laughs> but, um, so uh, I would like to say that, number one, why not? That, that it's not, uh, but on the other hand, I would like to, to, to say that we can cooperate without a world sp uh, a space agency. And we demonstrate that almost every day. The, the, the key, and I must say for that, uh, the European Space Agency is certainly a, a, a good model. The, the key is to leave the flexibility to the member states to cooperate or not to cooperate. It should not be uh, an obligation to cooperate. It, it's, again, it, it must be a mutual interest to, uh, which drive a, cooper a cooperation. Because if it's an obligation, frankly speaking, uh, you need an army to, uh, to make sure that uh, the, uh, the obligations will be respected. So I think that the World Space Agency could give principles, framework, but anyway, uh, in that world space agency, it would be, it, it must stay the freedom to cooperate or not to cooperate. And this is a case in the European Space Agency. There is 22 countries, but uh, uh, there is only one program which is mandatory, which is a science program. And as I said, this is certainly on science that uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can draw mutual interest. But all the other programs of ESA are optional, meaning that you can contribute or not contribute, and nobody will, uh, uh, will complain to the point that among the 50 plus uh, programs at ISA, uh, uh, you have all the range of programs. You, you have programs where there is only one member state using the structure of ISA to make a national program to the mandatory program where the 22 member states uh, are contributing. Uh, so that is certainly, the flexibility is important. The uh, cooperation should not be an obligation.
Thank you for your answer. Um, I'm coming to a second question, which is, do you think that the 70s space treaties are holding space agencies from using nuclear reactor-driven electric propulsion? I don't, I don't really think so. I, I think the, um, the treaties would be changed if people wanted to change them. Um, if we really want to go to Mars and, and pioneer the, the moon with people living there, we need nuclear power and propulsion in space. Um, the, if for, for several decades now, um, People have been uh, counseled by their fears uh, of nuclear power and propulsion rather than uh, following, following the promise. Um, only when there is a broader and deeper education will we see nuclear power and, and propulsion in space, I think. And I think the treaties are not the object, the people are the object. Um, I, I point to... Uh, France is an exception, a good exception, but most countries in the world are not using nuclear power for the majority of their electric power generation. And for just, for just one example of how, I'm sorry, I will use the word stupid, how stupid I think that is, is we talk about wanting electric vehicles in order to reduce pollution but if you have studied thermodynamics, as most people here must have studied, then you know that in order to generate a watt of electricity, you will burn more hydrocarbon in the generating plant than you would if you burned it directly in the car. So this is stupid. Um, so the only way in which an electric vehicle architecture makes sense uh, is if we are using nuclear power to to provide the electricity there are exceptions for countries like like Norway which have ample hydroelectric power but that is not the exception for the world so until we overcome our silliness and this is not just United States silliness or any one country's silliness it is almost global until we overcome our our silliness about using nuclear power on earth we will not see it in space Okay, I shall not uh, enter in the debate myself on the nuclear, nuclear power, but more on the propulsion. Uh, because we cannot imagine to continue to explore space the way we are exploring space today. Uh, taking six months to go to Mars and going there only during windows of a few weeks every 26 months, frankly speaking, uh, we shall not go very far uh, for very long. So we, one of the strongest limitations that we have today to explore space far away and also fast because uh, it's uh, very slow. Uh, the uh, Rosetta mission uh, we went to a comet, uh, as I said many times, it took five years to decide Rosetta, 10 years to develop it, 10 years to go to the comet, meaning 25 years between the idea of the scientist and the first data. And I was saying when I was DG of ESA that the best quality of the scientist is to be in good health because he has to survive 25 years between the day he, has, he wants to have some data and the day when he received the data. And that, this is due to the limitation of uh, travel. We, we, are still, uh, we, we are still using the propulsion of the V2. Huh? Uh, we have made a lot of progress on a lot of uh, aspects of space activities, except on propulsion. We are still using the propulsion uh, developed in the 40s. And uh, so I don't know if this is the nuclear propulsion. I don't know if this is another type of propulsion. There, there is a lot of uh, studies, uh, but we need to change 
the way we are going in space and back. But the, but the treaties are not the... No, 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 the, the treaties... The treaties are not the problem. Again, the, the, the treaties, the, the, the current treaty uh, is uh, uh, coming from the 60s and, uh, and, uh, and space has changed so much since uh, this uh, treaty has been uh, approved. And, uh, but by the way, I, the, 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 outer, the International Outer Space Treaty uh, has been developed in the 60s by the two space powers of that time, uh, United States and USSR. The other countries, they were not space power. So uh, obviously, they have uh, followed and accepted what uh, the two space powers have uh, put in, uh, in place. And I must say that the, the articles of the treaties are still, uh, still OK. But uh, space today is so different from the one in the 60s that uh, there could be a, a, a lot of additions, because at that time, there was only two space powers. And it was purely governmental. Today, there is uh, more than 60 countries working uh, on space and a lot of private enterprise. So the, 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 the world is totally different, but the treaty is still the same. So uh, yes, maybe it would be good to, to revise. But uh, usually, the law follows the facts, uh, and which is not bad, I must say that. Uh, because if we start by the law, it will, uh, it will be difficult. Uh, but usually, again, the, the facts precede the law. Thank you. So yes, today the space is really different than it used to be. And the sector is, going, is undergoing a lot of transformation. And we see more and more private actors in the sector. So Mr. Dorda, you told us about uh, cooperation and also um, uh, competition, thank you. <laughs> so, but with private actor, this raises the issue of um, industry security and industry interests. So, do you think that it could hinder, in fact, the, co the cooperation between the countries? Cooper cooperation helps also to compete. Huh? Uh, I think that. The, as I said, the, the normal life and the normal industry, we should not, let's say, space, unfortunately, has developed as a very specific sector, but that was a mistake. That was a mistake. Space is, uh, belongs to uh, industrial activities, economic activities, and so on, and there is no reason to uh, look at space totally differently or even worse, opposite to the normal world, the, the, the real world. And, and the, the normal world is made of cooperation and competition. Uh, you, again, you cooperate, I am sorry to repeat that, uh, you cooperate when you have mutual interest and you compete when you wish to win. And sometimes to win, you f try to find partners with which to cooperate to, uh, and that it's the normal world. It's, uh, uh, and, and it's normal that the private companies are playing that game. Uh, let's say when, when two automotive uh, industry uh, decides to develop an engine together, they develop the engine together, but after they compete uh, when, they, when they sell the cars. Uh, and that it's, it's normal in automotive. Why it would not be normal in space? So this is uh, exactly uh, what is today going on in space. Uh, so the, the, the private actors, and this is very good news, the private actors have a tendency to move the space sector into a normal sector, just a normal sector. And, uh, and I think it's good for space. Thank you for your answer. Um, you spoke about the fact that during the 70s, uh, the, um, the space uh, was uh, largely divided between Russian exploration and American exploration. Nowadays, there are new, new entrants such as private actors, but also uh, China. China is a growing player in space, but 
uh, for the time being, it seems to have lost interest in international missions. Do you expect China, the Chinese space industry, sorry, to open up in the next decade? I, I do not know what to expect of China. And I'm not sure that any Westerner does. Um, as you say, it is a plain fact that the Chinese seem to um, to want to go by themselves. And uh, as Monsieur Dautin has said, um, cooperation cannot be an obligation, it must be a desire. Um, when the desire is there, I am sure that the Western space countries will be will be welcoming, but welcome must must occur on both sides. We shall see. I am convinced that, uh, and I hope, by the way, that uh, all countries of the world will uh, will again cooperate and compete uh, together. I think that. Uh, what uh, what I am dreaming of it's uh, to uh, uh, to have a, gl a global vision and not to exclude anyone. But uh, obviously, uh, each of the ones who are working together, they must wish to work together, and uh, and uh, and I hope that uh, that will uh, that will come because. Uh, they are mutual interest, uh, in, including between the United States and China. I shall give you an example because this is something that I, am, I have discussed already uh, on, the, on the two sides. Uh, for example, the, the, the problem of uh, the space traffic management and space debris. Uh, this is a topic of mutual interest. Uh, and today, uh, since uh, there is no real, uh, there is there are discussions in Vienna, in the UN, and so on. But this is just best practice, uh, 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 good behavior. But that, frankly speaking, uh, best practice and good behavior is just for those who, who wish to have good behavior. Not uh, and, uh, and myself, I am convinced that. We must have uh, regulations of the traffic in space, uh, as well as there is regulations for the air, air traffic, regulations for the maritime traffic. There is no reason whatsoever to have no regulation for the space traffic. Uh, but for that, we need to have the, the countries ready to, to talk. I have no solution. I don't know which regulations. But they, they should talk. And I, uh, I said already to my uh, U.S. friends, uh, you should talk to China, at, at least on that topic. The rest, uh, but uh, at least on that. And uh, I have told the same to the, to the Chinese. But OK, I am uh, still waiting for that. Uh, but I hope, I hope, you know, I am optimistic. You cannot, you cannot be the DG of visa without being optimistic. That it's uh, for sure. Thank you for being optimistic about the future. And the, we are going back into the past now with the Space Shuttle and the Hermes program. So it's two questions in one for you two. Uh, to Mr. Griffin, do you think that the Space Shuttle program was a good idea in regards of the cost and the complexity compared to a more classical vehicle? And to Mr. Dordan, do you think that ESA should have carried on the Hermes program I would rather, I have been on record for many years, I, I would rather that the United States, uh, at a time when we were, were doing these things by ourselves, I would rather that we had continued with our explorations of the moon and uh, as opposed to um, spending our money. We, we only had so much money to spend. Even if the United States is a rich country, we only had so much. And if we were going to continue our lunar explorations, we weren't going to develop a shuttle. And if we were going to develop a shuttle, we were not going to continue to the moon. So I would have preferred the moon, and I would have preferred to have our international partnership that we have on the space station. Uh, I would have preferred to have that partnership 
on the moon. That is my preference. That is not what was done historically. Um, it, it doesn't mean that the, there's often confusion on this point. It, it doesn't mean that the Apollo vehicles were good vehicles and the space shuttle was a bad vehicle. They were designed for different purposes to do different things in different times uh, under different political circumstances. Um, I prefer one set of circumstances over the other, but you, you don't you don't build a you don't build a space vehicle, you don't build any vehicle, you don't build anything, and then ask what it can do. You decide what you want to do, and then you build the the engineering hardware to accomplish that. So, I I, I wish to criticize no engineer. Um, for shuttle or Apollo or Hermes or anything else, uh, the, the question to be decided at the level of, of society is if you're going to spend X dollars in space, what do you want to do with that? And then you, then you build what you need to build to accomplish what you say you want to do. Okay. I well, I, I have worked myself on the space shuttle. I have worked on the I space know, shuttle I, I engine. And, we, uh, we have I both worked say, on yes, the space and, shuttle. Uh, I must <laughs> say that it was certainly, uh, as an engineer, the best, uh, the, the the best period of my life because I think that the, the space shuttle man engine and is is a fantastic engine. Uh, but okay, uh, coming to Hermes, Hermes. Uh, was decided uh, in uh, 1987, uh, just before the uh, the break of the Iron Wall, and uh, and at that time the, the 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 objective and the ambition of Europe was to develop its own system uh, because there was on one side uh, United States, on the other side uh, USSR, and Europe. Uh, wanted to uh, to have a third uh, route uh, by uh, developing uh, developing Hermes, uh, and we have worked a lot on Hermes. And I have worked also on Hermes, uh, but uh, uh, the uh, the political uh, the political uh, framework has totally changed with the break of the Iron Wall, and. Uh, that has changed totally the uh, the perspective to to the point that uh, the the priority was to develop together the international space station and uh, by developing together the international space station the role of Hermes was uh, was not anymore uh, uh, important or as important as it uh, could have been uh, before. That is number one. This is a political change which has uh, be one of the problem of Hermes. The second problem of Hermes is that the Hermes vehicle was more difficult than the space shuttle because the, the a wing vehicle, a small wing vehicle, is much more difficult to, uh, to design than a big wing vehicle. Obviously, there was no propulsion on Hermes. The propulsion was provided by Ariane, but the, the re-entry of Hermes, I can tell you, I have worked on that, uh, was much more than difficult than the one uh, of the space shuttle, meaning that the budget of Hermes has uh, uh, gone uh, increased by a factor of two or three in a, just a couple of years, just because we have realized that uh, it was not just a carbon copy of the uh, of the shuttle, much more difficult. So because of that, uh, Hermes was uh, abandoned, and uh, it's a pity for the engineers. But I would say not a pity for the European space activities because uh, Hermes would have taken a significant part of the of the budget. And uh, just to say, because since I have been a professor of mechanics here, the uh, communicating vessels 
uh, exist only in fluid mechanics, not in budget mechanics. It's uh, so. Uh, I think that for the European space activities, certainly it was good because uh, that could uh, give the possibility to uh, ESA to become the, the, the agency who has made the, the, the most important effort for Earth observation, uh, environment, and, uh, and natural disasters, because the, the program of ESA on that is, uh, is very, very important. And I am not so sure that uh, we could have been able to do that if we had developed the MS as planned. Thank you. Um, going back to the present and even the future, uh, a lot of the audience members have requested to uh, ask, what upcoming NASA and ESA missions are you the most excited about? Well, I, given the remarks I just made, I will be most excited about NASA's efforts to return to the moon. And um, I'll stop there. I mean, I can only be most excited about one thing. <laughs> no, but clearly the Artemis program is uh, is the highlight of the uh, of the current uh, not only NASA but NASA ESA cooperation because there is a lot of contribution uh, from ESA to the Artemis program. Uh, we uh, we we mentioned the European Service Module, which is a very important part of the crew transportation, but there will be also a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, European procurement for the, uh, the gateway. Uh, there, there will be no shortage of opportunities for other nations to participate. Yes, so, uh, so I think that uh, the, this is certainly uh, a very important uh, cooperation because uh, it's not return to the moon. It's much more than that. This is not just making another Apollo uh, uh, 60 years later, but uh, it's to stay on the moon and to stay together on the moon. So the, the objective is not anymore to, to be the first and to, uh, to put a flag. Let's say that was the, 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 the world of the 60s, but that world is totally obsolete. Uh, while uh, now the Artemis program is a cooperation program, uh, we shall be together, and uh, it will be also staying on the moon. And to stay on the moon, we shall have to use the uh, the resources, the lunar resources, and that will make also uh, an enormous difference. Let's say on the Apollo program, the astronauts they were bringing. Uh, every kilogram and every liter of liquid uh, from uh, planet Earth to the moon. Uh, we, we, they cannot do that on the Artemis. Uh, they will have to use the lunar resources, and that it's a, it's a totally open new uh, domain of activities because uh, extracting and uh, using, uh, storing and using resources uh, from the moon uh, on the moon is uh, is certainly uh, a very important difference. So the Artemis is not just the repetition of Apollo six years later. It's totally different. Right. I have time for one last question. Yes. So that's the last question. Um, looking on the moon, maybe we can go a bit further now for this last question, which is a bit original, but would you bet on the discovery of extraterrestrial life in the next century? I would, I would bet on the discovery of extraterrestrial life in the next century, yes. Because I think our scientific instruments are becoming so impressive and so good that we will be able to look at uh, planets around many other stars and I this is one of the great scientific questions of our age. Are, are, is, is life only on this earth or is it elsewhere in the universe? Leaving entirely aside the question of whether it is intelligent life, okay, but just life. I think that we will see examples of, of life uh, from the chemical signatures that we measure on other planets. I, I believe that we will. I can be wrong, right? We flip a coin, I'm either right or wrong. 
oh, myself, I am convinced huh, that there is life uh, elsewhere. I must say, only the humans consider themselves unique, but yeah. that, uh, unfortunately, uh, this is human nature. And, uh, but there is no reason whatsoever that there is only one place in the universe that uh, there is life. So I am convinced uh, that uh, there is life somewhere. But okay, I must say, that I am old enough, no, nobody will, uh, will complain uh, because I am sure that it will come later. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but we shall, I am sure that we shall find life. Now, which type of life? That uh, it's That's still an interesting uh, question. Uh, that it's still to be to be seen, but uh, but there is the the, the breakthrough initiative that uh, Yuri Milner has uh, uh, started in in the U.S. and uh, we we have met our colleague Pete Warden uh, uh, at ISC and. Uh, and, uh, and Monsieur Milner is spending a lot of his uh, money to uh, to try and find out. Uh, he's not the only one. I am uh, uh, mentioning him, but uh, but there is a lot uh, more and more projects related to that. So uh, it will come. I am sure. Now when. We shall see, but uh, humans are still there for some time. Huh? That it's uh, so. The, the date is not the most important one. No, yeah. I think the life of these humans in the universe will cease in the not terribly distant future, but <laughs> other life in the universe will be there. <laughs> so. Well, let's take the bet. <laughs> So this conference is coming to an end. Unfortunately, a lot of questions are still unanswered. But thank you all for being here and asking this very interesting question. Maybe to conclude, we can have a last word from Alain Boreas, president from XSpace. Yes, uh, I want really to thank uh, both Mike and uh, Jean-Jacques for this very uh, exciting uh, conference and to come uh, here in Palaiso for addressing uh, all the people, of course, uh, the, the students who are there and who are more and more excited uh, on, uh, on space, and also all the alumni which uh, uh, we represent, the X space, you mentioned, not SpaceX, huh? X space <laughs> uh, group. Uh, a lot of them are uh, here today. So thank you again and uh, congratulations for this uh, wonderful conference. Thank you. Anna. Thank you.